I suppose what we could do, let's say, if we don't get on live online, is if anybody sends in any questions, we could answer them separately after. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that they don't... We could also... Hi, everyone. Welcome to our very first Facebook Live event. Apologies for the technical glitches. It's just how it goes, but we are very happy to be here. Um, we just need to maybe wait a few minutes for others to join us. So um, whilst we do that, please put any questions you have into the chat. So we'll just wait a couple of moments. Okay, well, I think we'll get started. So, um, as I said, this is our very first live book, uh, faced, um, our first Facebook Live event, um, and it's part of our launch programme for our Dementia Carers Count Virtual Carers Centre, or the VCC, as we tend to call it. So, the Virtual uh, Carers Centre is for family members and friends who are looking after or supporting someone with dementia. And it's available to you and you can visit it any time, uh, day or night, to find a really wide range of information and support. So everything on the VCC has been put together by health and care professionals. Um, we cover topics such as how to manage emotions, um, any everyday challenges you might experience, looking after your own physical and emotional health as a carer, and how the brain is affected by different types of dementia. And of course, the topic today that we're going to focus on and discuss is actually practical information about um, dementia and continence. So just to introduce ourselves, my name is Lizzie Edwards. And my name is Lorraine Heening. And we are both health and care professionals at Dementia Carers Count. So before we start our Q&As, just some important housekeeping. Uh, the event is being recorded and will be uploaded to our Facebook and our YouTube channels. And also, if we don't get around to answering your question today, please do send it um, to the email address shared in the comments bar um, and we'll do our best to answer it. So um, we've got a question here, Lorraine, which is um, my husband is having problems with incontinence, but he's refusing to accept it. What can I do? Yeah, I think um, it's such a taboo subject, um, even still today, although there's been a lot of work around um, trying to kind of reduce the stigma, it still exists to some degree. Um, it's a, a bit of a taboo subject, really. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to break that vicious circle, actually, by addressing it pragmatically and by in a direct manner you know just raising the issue because uh, sometimes you find within families everybody's thinking about it but nobody wants to raise it and when you actually open up the subject people will will, will start to discuss it um, but you have to be careful about the right level of openness that's required for kind of individual situations because we're all unique as we see in dementia um, and again I think you have to remember that the person with dementia may also feel quite uncomfortable um, about the idea of receiving that intimate personal care it's some, some Something I think we all don't want to lose um, and they may struggle with that loss of privacy and dignity as well. Um, sometimes um, it might be easier for a person to accept a discussion about continence issues from a professional and um, sometimes they find it difficult to discuss it within a in, in a family setup because of the embarrassment they feel but a professional there's that level of kind of um, uh, step away really you know um so again i think uh, it's helpful if you can speak to the gp who might be prepared to talk to them if they know them um, or ask for a referral to the continence services who are very skilled at dealing with, with continence issues and have a lot of techniques they can use to engage people and um, so again sometimes it's better leaving it to professionals rather than causing arguments and conflicts within the family um, and again sometimes to to maintain dignity for both partners you know um, it's sometimes helpful to focus on the person's um, strengths you know things they can still do rather than saying things like well you can't do that anymore I'll have to do it it's saying well you can do that but and what can I help you with you know so you're offering help rather than saying that you need to do it 
Um, I think, again, um, sometimes that takes a bit longer, but I think it's better for the person in the long run if they can maintain some kind of independence. I think the other thing for me is plan ahead and be prepared so that you can get things done efficiently without causing too much embarrassment for the person as well and get things over as quickly as possible. Yeah, it is a really difficult thing to talk about, isn't it, in it families? Is. Yeah, yeah, it's very hard. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, we have another question, um, which is, my wife has continence issues, so where can I go for help? Yeah, um, it kind of varies across the country, but there's kind of some things that every service in the country will have a continence assessment, which... Um, you usually access through the GP service, um, and that's really because we would want to rule out some physical causes first. Um, so the GP would do a few tests, you know, just to check out any physical health issues, and they may actually start some treatment that might resolve the problem. Um, and if not, then they can actually refer you on uh, to, to the actual continent services as well. I think is for, that's for the person with dementia and the carer, but there's also... Um, obviously the carer's needs that need to be brought into the process. So again, um, looking at a carer's assessment, which every area in the country will now uh, offer, and that's about looking at the carer's needs as well. Um, it's also helpful, I think, before you go to an, a continence assessment, to, if you've prior um, recorded um, the frequency and the intensity of the problem. Um, so it's documented and it helps um, because actually they might ask you to go back and do that if you haven't done it already. It just kind of jumps a little uh, thing as well. So I think there's just, uh, most people, as I say, will access it through their, um, their GP. That's the best quote of call to start with. Yeah, I think that um, idea as well about recording um, incidents is such a good idea anyway, isn't it? Because whenever you go to see a healthcare professional, you're always asked for details and it's always so easy to forget in that moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have um, a question or a comment here, which is I'm in the same place with my mum and her memory. She mm. won't accept that she gets lost. We have had a referral to the memory clinic, then she refuses to go. How can I get help to support her and my dad, who is 85 and supporting her? That's really difficult, as we hear that a lot, don't we? Mm. That people don't really want to accept that, that there, are, yeah. there are difficulties. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a common thing with people with dementia, yeah. isn't it? Sometimes you see that quite a lot. I think um, the if they won't accept going to the memory clinic again I think talking to I think older people tend to have a respect for doctors you know um, and, and it's usually people they know them quite well um, and sometimes they'll accept something coming from them rather than from yeah. family members so I think it's about drawing those professionals in to help in that way and again speaking to your continence um, assessment service and explaining the problems that you're having and they might find ways sometimes they'll come out to the house and they'll see people in their own homes as well um, or they might refer you to an occupation therapist who can help with wayfinding and, and you know maybe some of that sort of, uh, orientation difficulty that people have sometimes finding the toilet because sometimes that's the only problem they've got you know they can yeah. still use it but finding it can be a problem so there's lots of little things that you can do to help that the person with dementia find their way down to the toilet so so certainly um, speak to the other teams as I say sometimes they'll come out occupational therapists will come out and look at your environment and offer some advice as well uh, so so you can talk to them directly it doesn't necessarily um be the the person with the age they need to speak to yeah no that's that's really yeah. that's really good advice um so i have a another question here which is um where can i get pads from well I think that's one of the things um, many people think the only solution to continence problems is to start using a pad and, and it's actually not the case and um, that really should be your last resort rather than that starting point really um, and that again that's where a professional continence assessment is really important um, you know again and provision varies from region to region um, um, and there's a range of products that really can help so you know sometimes there's a physical cause that might be causing it might be an underlying illness that people are not aware of it might be medications that they're using that can be adjusted or changed um, so, so there's there's things like that that can that can be a starting point really um, and again there's handheld urinals for men and women that can be used instead of pads and um, there's commodes and bedpans that can be used at night time particularly for mobility 
mobility is limited um, and there's kind of absorbent products that you can use within normal underwear rather than actually using a pad um, that is protective really and that can preserve dignity rather than having to put a pad on um, as well. There's mattress protectors and absorbent sheets that are available um, and a lot of these things are um, available locally and, and through some NHS services as well. Um, yeah. As I say, I think it's just um, catheters are something that we wouldn't recommend. It's fine in the short term, you know, if there's a particular medical condition and you need that intervention. But the long term uh, issue with having a catheter, um, it can cause, to, it can lead to some serious um, medical problems. So we wouldn't recommend that. Right. Great. Thanks very much for that. I've had a couple of comments. Mm -hmm. um, one is uh, my husband was in a care home, but having had incontinence for six months, which was getting worse, yeah. um, I was told he wasn't even on the waiting list because COVID had virtually stopped continence assessments. And I think we've heard quite a lot over the last few months how COVID has really interfered with services for people. Yeah. Um, another comment is uh, mum takes medication to poo, then takes medication to stop and has lost loads of weight. So it's that sort of that balance as well, I suppose, isn't it? But, with, with yeah, kind of medication yeah. and management of, of incontinence. I think what I would say about medication is sometimes medication get, can get prescribed and it's not reviewed. If you know if medication is not doing the job it's been prescribed for, it should be reviewed and it should be stopped if it's not working. You know, and it's really important that everybody, you know, no matter who they are, gets a regular medication review um, because it's really important for older people in particular because they can be really vulnerable to a lot of the side effects. So absolutely. And your local pharmacist is very good for that. Okay, that's really good advice. Thanks for that, Lorraine. Um, mm -hmm. A question about pads. How do you know which size to use? That's where the continent service comes into play because they're able to work that out you know, knowing what the person's problem is, knowing their size, knowing um, the kind of volume of, of the urine the person will pass, when it's passed, you know, so all those things they take into, that's where the professionalism comes into play. So, yeah. you know, it's not just about going to the chemist and getting a large pad because there's much more to it. It's much more complex than that. Yeah, and it's getting advice, uh, access rather to that specialist yeah, advice absolutely. assessment, isn't it, that you, yeah. you need, yeah. Um, another question is, uh, my gran is having more and more accidents and not getting to the loo in time. Mm -hmm. um, why is this happening? What's causing it? And is there anything I can do? Um, I think, again, I think kind of covered it in some respects is that there's a lot of things that happen that can cause problems with continence issues. Um, so we've got normal aging changes that happen, you know, um, our visual system changes as we get older, the person might have cataracts or glaucoma or macular degeneration and really just uh, reduced peripheral vision that might cause them issues in the bathroom. Um, it might be their mobility, you know, that, that as we get older, our joints age, we become less mobile and our range of movement to kind of sit down, bend, turn around, or to get on the toilet can be difficult as well. So again, um, it's, it's helpful to get advice on that. Um, and again, our urinary system changes as we age as well. Men have an increase in urinary frequency and often that's due to a degree of prostate enlargement and Women have kind of a decrease in their perineal um, muscle tone, so uh, holding the, the urine in can be a problem for older women, and they end up with stress incontinence. So, and both genders tend to have um, an increase in their urinary output at night um, as we get older as well. Um, and of course, then we've got all the changes that happen in dementia. You know, with the changes in the brain, so our occipital lobe changes. You know, so you know, being able to find our way to the toilet, recognizing objects in the toilet, and how to use them can be problematic. Um, our temporal lobe gets affected, so our memory to figure out how to get to the toilet, to how to use the, the, the tools, all that sort of stuff uh, can be affected. Understanding what somebody's saying to us when they're prompting us to go to the toilet um, or being able to ask, you know, um, how to get to the toilet. Uh, those things can happen. Uh, again, um, being able to um, orientate ourselves to the, the, the bathroom and, and actually coordinate our body to actually sit on the toilet and get back up and then to turn and clean yourself. All those things can go wrong just due to the changes with dementia as well. Um, and again, the frontal lobes um, that are situated at the front of the brain can affect um, our personality and behaviour. And we might become a little bit more emotional about things that we would normally have taken in our stride. Or we might become a bit more disinhibited and, you know, just 
you know, we wherever we, we see a, a corner or a pot, you know, these kind of things can happen as well. Um, and we're maybe not so motivated either. And um, that's our motivation center. And sometimes we might not be as motivated to go up and use the toilet as we would normally be. So there can be a variety of things going on. And that's why assessment is really important. Yeah, I think that's really, you know, brought it home when you have listed the range of things that can actually affect someone's ability to go to the toilet. It's not always about holding no, it in, is no, it? It's exactly, about so many other right. things. There's, there's, there's lots of other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah amazing. Um, a, a question around pelvic floor exercises. Coughing and sneezing can sometimes be an issue. Is there any advice around pelvic floor exercises? What would you advise around that? Well, you're never too old to do the exercise. <laughs> I would say, you know, I don't give up. I think, you know, there's lots of very simple exercises you can do. Um, a physio can advise you about that. The continent services can advise you about that. So, and again, I think the more active the person is, it's, it's quite easy as you get older just to kind of become a bit too sedentary you know so I think even just getting up and walking to the toilet or walking to the dining room or walking to the kitchen just getting that body moving but there's specific um pelvic floor exercises that can really help actually yeah yeah and there's quite a lot online as well about pelvic floor exercises there is, as well, loads of they? Stuff. They are, yeah they're yeah. Kind of quite straightforward to do but they, are, remember, they are really remember. helpful for coffee yeah. there, there is some kind of electronic devices you can get now that can help with that too mm -hmm. uh, but again they could be costly um, and you yeah. need a bit of advice about what to choose yeah 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 um a comment here uh, my husband did have awareness uh, i'm assuming of, of needing to go to the toilet but not when it came to recognizing that he was wetting himself so that sort of sensory feedback that's sort of yeah, getting yeah, affected yeah. there yeah. Absolutely. I think that there comes a point in dementia where your sensory system starts to um, really become quite uh, affected by uh, the mm -hmm. changes in the parietal lobe in particular. Um, so your sensations, um, you don't rec the body doesn't recognise some sensations. So that sensation, when we've got that urgency, we know that we need to go to the toilet, but we can yep. hold it in. Um, you know, that just goes sometimes and, and people then will just uh, do it where they are. Really. Yep. So it can be quite difficult. Yeah. Um, we did touch on medications uh, a little oh. while ago, but are there any, specifically any drugs or medications that can help manage incontinence? There are some medications out there that can help, but the problem if you've got dementia is sometimes the medications that we would give you for continence can affect your cognition. So, you know, it's that double-edged sword, really. So sometimes it's a bit of a balance. But again, you would need to be assessed um, to find out what the actual root of the problem is um, before any medication would be prescribed. But the other thing to say is that if older people often have a lot of multiple uh, aging problems and they're on lots of medication and sometimes it can be that medication that can be causing the problem so again getting a medical a, a medication review can be really helpful because like for instance there's one or two of the blood pressure tablets that can cause people to cough so if you've got stress incontinence that will pro cause you a problem but that can be changed very simply to something else that won't give you that side effect. So again, it's just it's just getting that that um, advice, um, that specialist advice. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thanks. Um, another uh, question here. My mum's having more incontinent episodes, both urinary and bowel, um, mm. but we are both uncomfortable with me helping her, especially managing the, the bowel accidents. Um, what kind yeah. of help to, could we get with this? Uh, I think at this point, it, you know, when both of you are really struggling with it, it's about acknowledging that, you know, um, and then I think it's about asking for help. Um, and sometimes things are best left to professionals. And um, what you don't want to do is damage the relationship between, you know, mother and daughter or husband and wife, you know. Um, I think what you want to do at that point, if you're really struggling with it both, you know, as I said earlier, sometimes it's easier for the person to accept a stranger doing that kind of care rather than a person that, that's close to them. Um, so again, it's, it's about asking for help. So trying to get some carers to come in and provide that care. Most of the time, there might be times you would have to do it yourself, but um, I think it's definitely worth asking for some support with that again. Uh, and sometimes there's cultural expectations that are out there. You know, women tend to be expected to be the carer for those kind of things, and or there might be other cultural reasons why it's it's, it's women uh, as well. Again, I think, um, but I think we just have to work out. Again, we're all very different, and we're living in different situations, but there. Are are, there are care, care or agencies that will come and provide that support at home. Yeah, yeah, that's a really difficult one, I think, isn't it? it? Is. Negotiating that, and particularly between yeah. um, 
children and parents it's not yeah. something yeah. that neither yeah. you can and, feel and I do think you really with. need to be honest because I think if you don't yeah. if you're not honest and upfront about how you're feeling it really will affect you in, in the law and we, you, it'll affect your psychological being you know um, yeah. and it may well affect your relationship with that person and you don't want to do that that's precious you want to keep it as as as, as good as it can be you know yeah. so yeah definitely yeah. Um, um, my dad is caring for my mum, but she's becoming more and more incontinent, but um, he won't get help. I, mm. uh, the person thinks he's actually really embarrassed about it. We've kind of touched on this a bit as well. Um, yeah. Have you got any advice like how to support him, I suppose, to sort of have that conversation or to get some help? Yeah, I think, well, if you, if you look at the research around continence and, and uh, dementia, really, I think um, you tend to find that a lot of family carers are reluctant to ask their help or raise the issue because right. they worry about they've got some concerns I suppose about the dignity and the kind of personhood of the, of the person they love you know they worry that you know that uh, and it might be that the person said something prior to this stage that they don't want you know anybody to come in and do any of that personal care and it can be a bit of a a, a worry for the person um again I think I said earlier it's sometimes better just to be open about it and open open up that conversation and, and try to come to some kind of agreement. And sometimes it's good to talk within families because you might not be the only member in the family um, who su provides support and someone might be better than other people. So it's a bit discussing between you who's best to provide that support. Uh, and if none of you feel co comfortable about it, I think again, it's, it's um, uh, you know, making sure that you ask for help as well. Um, uh, and I think it's important to look after themselves, as I said earlier, to try and maintain their, their, their role as a, as a carer. Um, and again, maybe a Carers Act assessment might be um, a Carers Assessment mm. uh, in line with the Carers Act, again, might help um, identify uh, areas where you can get some support. Uh, as well and I think it's about reassuring people that there's no shame in having continence issues mm. it happens to lots of people you know it's a fact of life you know um, and that you know a, a lot of people have them but there's lots of ways we can help to try and minimize the impact thank you very much thank you um, and we've just had a really sad mes message from oh, Angela yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry Angela I was just saying your <laughs> mum sadly just passed away from dementia and it is such a devastating disease and her funeral is tomorrow so we give you our condolences well, and hope so tomorrow you, yeah hope tomorrow yeah, absolutely well. thanks, so. thanks yeah. for tuning in yeah um Okay, well, I think we're probably going to wrap it up. So thanks ever so much, everyone, for, for coming and for the questions. It's been a really good discussion. Um, so I do urge you to go and have a look at our virtual carer centre where we have um, some more information on uh, managing our continents. Um, and we may not have answered all the questions today. So we do have a, a live online session um, this Wednesday, the 24th at two o'clock. So um, you can go onto our website and register for that. Um, and you can learn a little bit more about managing um, continents. And it's also an opportunity to ask more questions, but perhaps in a more private sphere. Um, uh, our link will be, uh, the, sorry, the link to that will be, will be shared with you. Um, and I say, don't forget to, to have a look at the Virtual Care Centre. There's a, there's a lot of information on there. So hopefully you'll find some, some useful information. Um, our next Facebook Live <clears throat> is on the 30th of November. And it's about carers' well-being. And that is with uh, Dr. Jemima Fitzgerald um, from 4 o'clock. So that's 4 to 4.30. And we do have another Facebook Live on the, um, oh, I don't have the date for it, but it's on uh, benefits and finance. It's in the beginning of December, um, on the 7th of December, um, 6 to 6.30. And that's with Jane Stanfield. So, um, yeah, thank you ever so much, everybody. And uh, I hope to see you again us. on Facebook Live. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.